Hello and welcome to Ticket Manager's All Access Interview Series, engaging leaders from across the sports marketing spectrum to identify and explore critical issues in the business of sports, entertainment, activation, sponsorship, ticketing, hospitality, and even more. I'm your host, Jim Andrews. Joining me on this episode is Brad Ross, Vice President of Global Sports and Entertainment Marketing and Partnerships for the Coca-Cola Company. Brad, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you join us. Hey, Jim. Thanks for, for hosting me and hi to all the listeners and the viewers out there from the Ticket Manager podcast. It's good to, uh, good to be here with you all. Yes, good to have you with us. Yeah, let's just start off at kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of, of Coca-Cola's approach to sports and, and entertainment partnerships, kind of the uh, the why behind them, if you will, before we, we zoom in on, on some specific areas. Now, clearly, you know, those of us in sports marketing are very familiar with the, the many landmark partnerships that Coke has, some of them going back decades now. But Brad, could you give us a, an update on, on how the company has evolved its approach to, to make sure that your partnerships are still relevant in today's marketplace, continue to deliver value for Coke? Look, to start off with, I think we have to answer the why. And why do we go into partnerships? Why do we build relationships with key rights holders? And it's a simple answer, to be honest. It's about being consumer-centric. For us, as a company, we want to make sure that the marketing that we put out there resonates with our consumers. And we also realize that, that to do this, we need to con connect with our consumers and our fans and our audiences through things that they care about. You know, so whether that is somebody who's into music or gaming or sports or fashion or follows a specific influencer, what we see is the opportunity within our marketing mix is to look through the lens of sponsorships as partnerships as a critical bridge to connecting with our consumers through things that they care about, leveraging the equity of our partners, of the rights holders we work with, of the, the teams that we engage with, to really bring to life areas that, that our consumers care about. We talk about evolution, and you, you mentioned it in the question, and I think there's some fundamentals at the end of the day. One is about resonating through things that people care the most about, so we continue to do that. But things have changed. The landscape has changed. You know, technology has changed. And so we've had to evolve with that. And so while we still have some traditional approaches to certain things, we've also evolved our thinking. You know, as a company, we're moving away from what we call in exposure to experiences. And we want to make sure that we're continuing to tap into experiences that, that matter to people. We believe that our partnerships and sponsorships portfolio help us do that. You know, technology has opened a whole new area of opportunity for us to look at things in a different light uh, from what was traditionally quite an analog approach to one that can be both analog and digital right. and can resonate across both, both, both of those memes. And, and so I think for us, it's really about evolving our way of thinking, but through things that people care about and, and, and making sure that the brands are salient and prominent in those moments. That makes a lot of sense. And you know, when I hear you say, you know, talk about consumers and identifying what they're passionate about, I'm thinking that, you know, I've recently been talking to a lot of B2B marketers and, and they would have seemingly a much more easy job because they could look at a very narrow target and say, we've identified that our customers like golf. So we're going to sponsor a golf tournament. For a brand like Coca-Cola, being as you know, broad-based in terms of the uh, your consumer base as well as your geographic reach around the world, obviously that makes for a, a much more complex set of decisions that uh, that I imagine you all have to make. Jim, I think you know we we've evolved as a company ourselves, and so from being one brand in one country as the Coca-Cola brand in the U.S. to being multiple brands in multiple countries uh, around the world. We, we look at it through a portfolio lens. And so it, it does add complexity for sure in terms of what's the right angle or the right mesh for a specific brand to be connecting with a specific consumer. But we do that through segmentation. We've been doing segmentation for a long time. And so we understand the consumer audience that we're talking to with a specific brand. Coke sure. absolutely is a bit more ubiquitous than many of the brands in our portfolio, but we do have niche brands that mm -hmm. focus more on a specific tribe. And so when we think about this, we, we look really carefully at the brand, the brand objective, the tribe that the brand is speaking to. And then based on that, we look at the passion points that resonate the most with that specific cohort. 
So, you know, maybe we're going after Gen, Gen Z for a certain brand and we need to understand, well, where's the trends and where's the demographics and what are the areas that Gen Z are more interested in? We may have another brand that's targeting more young adults and we need to understand, well, what does that mean? And then we also need to understand, you know, the, the value proposition of the brand itself and the salient product features that they bring into the mix. If we're talking about smart water or Powerade, it's a very different positioning and perspective than we are when we're talking about a Fanta or a Coke. Right. And so we have to take that into account too, is, is not all brands are equal in terms of who they're talking to and their reach, and not all passion points are equal in terms of who they connect with and where they connect. And so we do have to make sure that we understand the landscape fairly well and understand very specifically what the brand needs and the tribe that the brand's speaking to, and then generate what the right partnerships or passion points will be to connect with their specific tribe. You know, I'm fascinated by the the kind of ecosystem that your partners have, have to operate in. We're talking about a very complex global organization, as you just mentioned, multiple brands that you bring in butlers and other external partners. I imagine if you created a graphic uh, with all of the Coca-Cola entities that touched or are impacted by your partnerships, it would be a very massive matrix with a lot of different elements. So it's impossible to ask you to detail that uh, for us on a podcast, but can you just give us a general sense of that that structure that that you operate in when, you, when you're working with your global partnerships? Absolutely. It's kind of like asking, can you draw the Lumosphere, right? right there's, exactly. there's so many players and parts that, that go into, into the mix on this one. But um, right. yeah, we, we operate firstly as a relationship company, relationships with key partners, key customers, key bottlers. It's fundamental. It's in our DNA. And, and that's how we've always operated. 137 years. That's how we started the company. That's how we currently operate the company. So relationships are key. And I think that's the glue and the foundation that, that brings this all together. And as you said, Jim, our structure is a matrix. You know, we operate in over 200 countries around the world, multiple brands, multiple SKUs, and some local nuances and geographical uh, components to take into account when we look at this. And so at a global level, I'm very fortunate to have a world-class team that really are the best in class at what they do. Whether it's our music team, our gaming team, our football slash soccer team, our broader sports team. All of them have come from the industry, understand our system, understand how our system operates, and, and bring the best of both worlds to the, the equation. We work very closely with our, our operating units. As a company, we have nine operating units around the world, and we've tried to mirror what we do in the center or globally to what goes on in the operating unit. So, so we have teams in each of the operating units either identifying, executing, and building the deals, or bringing the deals to life that we've signed at a, at a more global level. And so, you know, for us, scale is important. We're, we're in the business of trying to do fewer things, but do them bigger and do them better. Mm. And that's one area that, you know, in our new network organization that we've built as a company to drive the growth of the company forward, we've looked at optimizing our portfolio of assets. We've looked to make sure that what we're doing is resonating and is relevant in the geographies that we're executing them in. And we're very open to, you know, the new trends or the new areas that are starting to grow and what we need to do. Now, there's no ways on this planet that we can do it all from the center. And that's why working with our markets and our operating units are, is critical. And just as much as we have a world-class team sitting in the center, we equally have world-class teams sitting in the markets. We have some amazing people that are the best in class in what they do and how they do it. And that's where the mat matrix and what we call the networked organization comes to life absolutely beautifully. L last week, I was actually talking to someone where we were speaking about AI and the role of AI, and he referenced NI. And when I pushed him, I was like, what are you talking about NI? And he said, networked intelligence. That's our competitive advantage. When we come together as a network, we will leverage our scale and we apply best practice learnings that many folks have had for many years that's where we start to really shift the needle and, and see, the, see the value. And so that's an interesting perspective as we talk about the, the size of the business, being global, but being local at the same time. I worry that you may have uh, struck fear in the hearts of some uh, rights holders when you talked about doing fewer things, but doing them bigger. But I think that is a general trend that we're seeing in, in the industry. So it, it certainly makes sense. And, and, uh, and, and maybe that's uh, 
if, if you're on the rights holder side of things, you want partners who are going to go deep with you, if you will, and, and do all of those activations. And in the long run, uh, kind of, I think that fewer, bigger strategy is one that has worked out quite well for, for companies and for properties. Exactly, Jim. You know, I think it goes both ways is, is doing fewer things, but doing them better means we're putting more money behind the activation of that specific asset partnership sponsorship, which I think benefits the partner and the rights holder just as much as it does us. You know, so if you have a long tail of assets that you're not putting money behind to activate and you're only putting rights fee, money into rights fees, it feels like you're parking a sports car in a garage and not really driving it or using it. I think on the other hand is when you when you when you when you're all in and that's what we try and do, you know, we strike up a partnership, we want to go all in, we put our muscle and our scale behind that partnership. And if we do it right, and if we do it in the right partnership mentality with, with our asset partners, then hopefully it's a win-win and it benefits both. And and it doesn't always work like that. I'm not gonna sit here and say we get it right every time. Right. Uh, right. But that's really the the you know, the North Star that it's a win-win and that the partnership and the ecosystem of the partnership, all parts are, you know, the sum of all parts are, are greater than the individuals. And, and that's where we want to get to. You know, Brad, I might steal your sports car analogy. I've been using buying the latest mobile phone, but not getting a charger with it. But I, I like the parking the sports <laughs> car and not driving it. So obviously, when many of us think about your global partnerships at Coca-Cola, Naturally, we gravitate towards the Olympics, FIFA World Cup. But as you mentioned, there's also esports and music and, and influencers now. When we spoke a little while ago, you mentioned, uh, and I love this term, co the collisions uh, that you're seeing uh, between all of those from a, from a consumer-facing perspective. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that impacts, impacts your, your approach to partnerships and activation? When we look at the landscape, and again, when we go back to the consumer-centric approach and we look at it through the lens of the consumer, with, with the role that technology plays today, with the ability to connect across so many passion points, we're seeing now more than ever that consumers are not solely a music listener or solely a gamer or solely a sports fan. More often than not, they're all three or all four. They care about fashion and, and they care about different elements of what comes to life with that rights holder and that partner. And, and that's where the concept of collisions is starting to play up, where you see certain ecosystems that are growing exponentially. You know, we think about the gaming industry and we think about one of our partners, Riot, who are far more than just a gaming company. They're an entertainment company. You think about starting with League of Legends to now multiple gaming titles to the advent of Arcane which is that exceptional series that they played on Netflix to the music component. And you start to see the ecosystem unfold. And so we're also learning from our partners where we're seeing things in a different light. And I think this is where we have to make sure that we continue to stay ahead of the puck and see where that puck is moving. Because this is an area that I think if you do it in silo, in, silo, in isolation, I don't think you're going to get there. You know, just this week, the IOC announced the, the the inauguration or the inaugural year of esports within the auspices of the IOC. And so while not part of the Olympics yet, they're starting an esports series. And the IOC, who's been one of our longest, in fact, has been our longest standing partner by LA 28 will be a hundred years partnership with the IOC. To see a rights holder with that pedigree and that lineage moving into a space to connect with today's consumers through a passion point that they care about is inspiring. It's inspiring to see a rights holder take the step and move into that direction. And they're not the only ones. There's multiple rights holders who are seeing it through that lens. So as a partner, when we look to do a deal and we look to come together, what, what, is, what more is it than just what the traditional rights are that you're putting on the table? How do we make sure we engage the consumer through his or her full life cycle and through all the areas of, of passion Versus just you're coming in, you're buying these rights, and and that's it, and that's where that notion I think really starts to get compelling. No, and 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 I love the IOC and esports example of that, and 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 when you talk about you know 
staying a step ahead, which is obviously very important uh, when you're in a competitive marketplace. And, and earlier you mentioned uh, AI and, and NI. That that leads me to to ask you about what everybody seems to be talking about, but nobody has a handle on yet. And that's kind of the metaverse and and uh, you know the, the the next iteration of of our online activities and and lives if you will is that something that you have started to explore thinking about at this point of course i think if if you're not there then you're not following the consumer and you're not understanding where he or her are, are operating and we've seen many many of our partners and rights holders also actively start to look into this the space i don't think there's 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 a one size fits all approach here. Right. I think there, there's a lot of risk that comes with operating in the metaverse that you have to be prepared for. And as a company, you then need to make the decisions on how far you're willing to go and what you're willing to do and how much you want to, you know, test and learn. And, and that's what we're certainly trying to do is we're taking a iterative approach. We're we're starting small, we're trying to learn fast, and we'll continue to grow from there. And the areas that we've Dipping our toe in, and it feels like that's not the right space, but we've tried. And then the areas where, you know what, this feels good. This feels like the right thing for that specific brand, for that specific partnership, and let's push a little bit more. And so I think you would be naive not to be investigating or at least considering the role that you and your brand could play in this space. But at the same time, your risk appetite has got to be there. And depending on that, how quickly you move into that space or not, will be determined by that approach that you and the company are taking. But Jim, for sure, for us, it, it, it is something that we're, we're actively pursuing. We're putting, putting toes in the water, as I mentioned, and figuring it out as we go. I, I don't think we have the answers. I'm not going to say we do, but I don't know anyone who really does, to be honest. And so we're trying <laughs> no, to all figure that out together. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Nobody has has figured it out, but but as you say, kind of building the bicycle as you, as you're pedaling, I think is what everybody's doing, and that makes you know it, for a fascinating time, and sure it can be challenging uh, for those who are, are in the middle of it, but but exciting as well. You know, from from that kind of you know future looking question, maybe to one that's a little bit more fundamental. How are you at Coca Cola now de- determining how your current partnerships are, are performing? Can you share something about your metrics or evaluation models that that you're using to determine the the ROO or the ROI on sponsorships? I think measurement and metrics are critical. Uh, if you don't know what you're measuring and you're not sure how to measure it, then you never know if what you're doing is successful or not. So I think that's that's foundational. The challenge, I think, that comes in the space is that there's so many measurement systems or ways to approach this, right. even the ratios that you're looking at, that you have to take all that into account. So it does become somewhat nuanced. Mm-hmm. And what we've also found is the way in the past, this is minus the NI, right? So this is without the network intelligence. Right. The way we were measuring a certain partnership in a certain part of the world was different to the way we were measuring a partnership in another part of the world. Mm, and so okay. what we've tried to do is to build a framework, an evaluation framework that is consistent. Mm. Is it the most perfect? I don't know. Is it 100% accurate? I don't know. But it's as close to it as possible right now. And what it does do for us is it does allow us to compare apples for apples. So within our portfolio, within our stable, we're able to one, see Partnership X and Partnership Y, what did they each drive based on metrics or objectives that we've set out through the same methodology that we've built so that you're actually being able to get a tangible, comparable data set that's actually showing you what this does. The objectives are also important, Jim, because in some cases we're looking at building a partnership that's going to come to life to really drive weekly plus or drive you know, immediate consumption of our products. That's one, one objective. And what that objective looks like and how that comes to life might be different to a partnership that's more focused on, you know, buying or building an asset or a partnership that we can use and leverage for our customer partners. That's slightly different. Or how do we buy or leverage or build an asset or partnership that we use for stakeholder engagement, company reputation? Each of those have a slightly different outlook in terms of what the the methodology could be. We're happy that we've we've landed now on on a on a set of um, methods that actually don't only look in isolation at the partnership, but look to see how it drives the business and it's integrated into our broader business measurement and metric system. 
So we're actually able to see, you know, as constructively as possible that this partnership or this asset or this sponsorship drove X, Y, Z for our business based on the business metrics and the business measures. Uh, we're not coming as the assets or sponsorship team or the sports and entertainment team and saying, oh, look what we did. Right. We're integrating it into the business results. And, and that's, I think, what drives more credibility for our space. It drives more credibility for showcasing the results and the value that this area uh, brings. And I think it shows more integration into really leveraging the power of partnerships and sponsorships to drive the business forward versus something on the fringe that's nice to have. Yeah, I, and that that's the fundamental there, I think, in the measurement side. So many of the things you just said you know, really, really resonate, and 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 that last part about you know really making sure that you have the credibility. And I think for so long we've in sponsorship we've kind of done ourselves a disservice by kind of creating separate tools <laughs> that that weren't kind of aligned necessarily with what the folks down the hall were doing, and that just you know it, it is maybe uh, in some some places impacted the ability for sponsorship to kind of have the seat at the table that that it deserves. So uh, I, I think that's really really spot on. And I I think also you know just putting the results as you said no evaluation system is perfect. However, that context, so that, as you said, even if we can just look and say property X versus property Y uh, and see and compare the two, that's that's valuable. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, Jim. We, we have done a disservice to ourselves, to the industry, to our partners, by not integrating this into the broader business metrics and the broader business growth strategies, right? And I think what we're also seeing now, going back to where I started around, we've got to be consumer centric. We've got to focus on things that matter to our consumers and we've got to focus on the things that they care the most about. Well, if that's the case, then surely some of these passion points that we go after should be more integral into the business plan than secondary or standalone. And you're starting to see that through some of the work that at least we're, we're doing. And we're seeing it with many other companies and partners out there where the passion point is becoming the center of a lot of the campaigns that are being developed. Yeah. Not as an ancillary or complementary, but embedded in the work, right? So, you know, whether we're talking about Coke Studio, which is our new global music platform, th that in itself is the campaign. Coke Studio is, you know, it, it's it's bringing the real magic of music to life for millions of consumers that care about this, that care about music, and they want to see or hear music in a certain way. And so, we understand that that starts to be embedded into the broader brand strategy versus a adjacency or a complementary. And I think that ties into the measurement conversation we just had too, which is about making sure that what you're doing is actually driving tangible results, not just on vanity metrics alone, but on metrics that actually matter to the business, whatever the business is, whatever the industry is, whatever the objectives you're going after, that it can tangibly and, and, and illustratively do that. Gosh, Brad, I mean, I, I, there's so many things I, I could ask you about and, and specific programs, but I want to be respectful of, of your time and the, and the listeners' time. So let, let me just ask you a final question, which is, what do you see as the biggest challenges for brands that have significant partnership portfolios like you do? Maybe put that another way. What, what would you like to see happen in the next year or so that would that could really help Coca-Cola extract more value uh, from its uh, from its partnerships? You know, the landscape has changed, Jim. I think we've seen as new industries emerge, industries we don't even know of today, mm. in a year's time from now, might have emerged. With that brings challenges and opportunities. You have different players in, this, in the partnership ecosystem. Some add in a lot of value to it and some not, which in itself is positioning the, the, the role of the partnership differently and, and differently across, you know, what the the intended objectives are. Now, that plays a role when you have long-term partnerships in place. Some of our contracts are long-term partnership, long-term contracts that we have in place. And while that gives you, obviously, a good perspective from a relationship point of view, it helps you drive better value in terms of the long-term negotiation and, and the construct behind that. At the same time, you've got to ask yourself, is it flexible enough to allow for changes that come up? Exactly. And I think that's the paradox that you have to deal with is, is what is the ideal lifespan of a partnership or a contract? You know, I think traditional schools of thought is, you know, the longer the better because right. you negotiate a long-term deal, you get it at a better price, you're able to negotiate better rights, and, you know, you don't have to go through contract negotiation every year. So 
Absolutely. All those pros are valid. But fast forward two years in and a new industry player emerges or things change, your own, your own business strategies change. How do you pivot? How do you adjust? And how are you flexible enough there? And so what I'd like to see from our rights holders, to be honest, is the ability to meet us halfway and be as flexible as possible when either we start to change course or pivot or the industry itself starts to change or, or, or course correct. And how do we maintain our long-term partnership and relationship, which is fundamental and foundational, but how can we move away from just the letter of the contract to find in a win-win in this new space? And some partners are very open to that. Some are fantastic, let me be clear, in terms of saying, we get it, we understand how the landscape's changing, we need to adjust ourselves, let's figure this out. You had X, Y, Z, now we're going to give you ABC, and you have that conversation and, and you figure it out together. Some are a bit more jaded in their thinking and and you just have to then deal with that and help educate them and bring them along the way so there's a there's the balance of the two right the flip side jim of course is getting into like one-year deals might not help you in the long term then you know then it's you're in and out are you building this this sustainable long-term partnership and relationship so what is that perfect lifespan of a partnership or sponsorship i don't know if i have the answer mm -hmm. but i think it's more about the intent and the relationship that you build that starts to you know, become critical in today's day and age. You will be governed by the contract. You will be governed by the long form. That is, you know, that, that's table stakes. But it's the relationship and how you map it out that I think is where it becomes important. And that's where having an account team on the partner side that actually understands your business, that knows what you're trying to achieve, that's not just trying to push a sales approach, but actually understands we get it. This is what you're trying to do. These are your objectives. Let's see how we can help you. That for me is where the partnership really is one plus one equals three. At the same time, there's a burden on the companies and the partners themselves. We have to do our very best to make sure that our partners know where our focus is, what we're trying to achieve with this, and how we need their help to unlock the value that we know can be there. And so it's a little bit of a dance both ways, but I think that's the beauty of the space we operate in. Because again, if you we borrow in the equity from a partner that knows how to connect with their tribe in a way that's authentic and real. How can we support that or be part of that and learn and listen to them? You know, hubris aside, arrogance aside, we need to also listen and learn from our partners because some of them know our consumers better than we do. Yes, I said it. Some of them do. And that's the, that's the role that I think these partnerships play for us in, in certain cases. That, that was so eloquently put and and you know it, it boils down to the fact that you know sponsorship it, it's not a transaction right and it it would be much easier to negotiate these these kinds of contracts if it was just you know paying a certain amount for a certain amount of product and then we're done and we can come back whenever we need to in five years 20 years and and, and renegotiate the terms clearly not not why any of us got into sponsorship because we don't want to just do those kinds of deals we like the relationships we like the changes and 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 needing to be flexible and creative and, and all of that so thank you for for that i think that's um, uh, it's a great place to to leave it as much as i'd love to continue uh talking more so brad just thank you so much for for sharing a little bit of uh, time and and certainly a lot of uh, great insights with me and and with our audience i know everybody will appreciate it uh, my pleasure, Jim. Real, pri real privilege to be able to have this conversation with you and, and your audience. And, and thank you for the invite and opportunity. Excellent. And on behalf of everyone at Ticket Manager, I want to thank all of you for watching and listening and to remind you to please join us again for the next episode in the All Access interview series.